Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and uh, to the uh, Mississauga uh, indigenous people for their welcome uh, to all of us. Uh, the uh, topic which uh, I have uh, been mandated to talk about has to do with uh, judicial activism, but uh, if truth were to be told, uh, I think that this whole debate about judicial activism is uh, uh, nonsense uh, imported really from the United States where it's uh, all mixed up with their particular constitutional um, history. But it does raise the, the question of uh, what uh, judges do and how law uh, develops and why our country is in the, uh, uh, in the way it is. And uh, reference was made to uh, uh, work on Aboriginal rights and that's one of the things that I want to touch on as we uh, progress. I think uh, the, uh, the notion that judges uh, should apply the law and not make it uh, is an import uh, from the United States because our history uh, is that judges have made law from time immemorial. Uh, in Britain, of course, there is no uh, written uh, constitution uh, the Constitution was created by the parliamentarians and by the judges. Uh, the common law was created by uh, the judges uh, and the lawyers uh, based on experience which changed uh, over time. Uh, the Americans have this vast uh, reservoir of uh, writings uh, by uh, uh, Jefferson and uh, Hamilton uh, and so on. And uh, we don't have that uh, uh, here. The conferences uh, that predated Confederation were pretty mundane affairs. Uh, probably the most uh, memorable line was uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, who said that too much whiskey was just enough uh, <laughs> to get the whole project off the ground. Uh, so, uh, the Constitution was drawn up in the bowels of uh, uh, Whitehall in, uh, in London by uh, draftsmen who basically uh, did ordinary commercial statutes and property statutes and uh, uh, did not consider themselves to be creating uh, the bones of a, uh, a country that would uh, uh, live on in uh, perpetuity. So uh, it has struck me really uh, when I went to the bench, became a judge, uh, after about 30 years practicing law, uh, just to the extent to which judges make the law are expected to make the law and should make the law. And uh, I know many of you have uh, some legal background, but uh, others don't, and so I want to talk about very general aspects of this uh, uh, question. And I want to go back to the patriation uh, reference, which was in 1982, and which, uh, as you will know, uh, had to do with attempting to bring the Constitution home from uh, the United Kingdom. And it was uh, an embarrassment that a country uh, that was then uh, over 100 years old uh, still uh, uh, had a constitution that was an ordinary statute to the British Parliament and um, that we had uh, no right uh, to amend it and we actually had no authority over it. It was entirely up to the people in, uh, in Westminster. And the great project was launched by uh, Trudeau the Elder, as I guess we now have to call him, uh, that uh, not only was the Constitution to be Canadianized, uh, but uh, a Charter of Rights and Freedoms would be added. 
And this was highly controversial at the time because this is not in the tradition of our laws. Uh, judges uh, have had no uh, authority to apply general standards of human rights to laws and say, well, uh, we don't think this uh, sufficiently uh, uh, avoids discrimination against uh, this, that, and the next thing. Uh, parliament is supreme, and if Parliament has uh, created an unjust law, uh, the courts couldn't do anything about it, provided uh, Parliament in Ottawa stayed within federal jurisdiction and uh, the provinces stayed within uh, theirs. But the project by uh, the uh, elder Trudeau uh, was, in his view, to uh, go to London uh, to speak uh, to uh, Westminster and simply say, I'm here, I'm the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, do what I say. And that by convention, uh, you really have no further hold over Canada, uh, and nobody else in Canada has any say in uh, how the Constitution uh, should evolve other than the federal government. And the provinces came along and said, uh, well, that's not true at all. Uh, Canada uh, sprang from a union of uh, the then existing uh, provinces. Uh, it was what they call a confederation pact. Uh, and uh, the normal rules of contract are that if you have a contract amongst 10 people and you want to change it, uh, then uh, the 10 people have to agree, as we're seeing now in the European Union with the Canadian uh, trade uh, uh, negotiations. So uh, Canada was confronted with this uh, uh, duality of opinion, these two very strongly held views. Most of the provinces lined up to say, uh, and blobbing in London to say that uh, Trudeau had no right to speak for Canada and Trudeau essentially treating provinces as little administrative units that had no uh, real importance in uh, legal terms. And uh, there, is, there is no legal solution to that uh, uh, issue. There are two arguments. And uh, a court which pretends to follow historical precedent uh, would have nothing to follow. Uh, so the court has to make up some kind of resolution or to throw up its hands and say there is no constitutional solution, there is no legal solution, uh, it's a free-for-all. And the Supreme Court in 1982 came up with a theory which had been developed by the Attorney General of Saskatchewan, which is that uh, the federal government could go to London and uh, have a charter of rights incorporated in the Canada Act with a, an amending formula, uh, provided there was substantial consent of the provinces, not unanimity, but substantial consent. And uh, I, was at the time, was in the uh, uh, Federal Department of Justice, uh, and uh, it was really a theory that had no solid legal basis at all. I mean, either uh, governments had gone to Westminster for mundane amendments that nobody cared about and nobody involved the provinces, or there was general agreement, as in the case in the 1930s, with uh, changes in the Constitution to try to deal with the uh, Depression. So the court uh, came up with this uh, formula, and because it is the Supreme Court, it becomes the law. But it has no roots. It has no legitimacy other than it comes from the top court uh, in the system and the nine judges who were appointed to their positions by rather uh, obscure means. Uh, but as between a free-for-all between the provinces and the federal government and the British members of parliament uh, voting their own uh, uh, viewpoints and uh, messing about in uh, Canadian affairs, it seemed to me that the activist uh, judges uh, were quite right. 
And there was a dissent in the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Laskin and a number of judges said, our job is to deal with the law. There is no legal impediment to uh, going to London. Uh, the majority were successful in saying, well, it would be legal, but it would be unconstitutional, which again was quite a novel idea that you could do something that was legal, but by reason of the conventions of parliament and so on, was unconstitutional. Uh, so we then fast forward uh, some years, and in personal terms, I'm, as Natalie mentioned, sitting on the Supreme Court, uh, fresh from uh, uh, Bay Street, uh, uh, doing uh, nothing very much. And uh, along comes the uh, Quebec uh, uh, reference, uh, which uh, had grown up in a number of different courts. There was a reference in Newfoundland and uh, in Quebec and in Manitoba, uh, all asking the question, well, if, if uh, Quebec were to pass a resolution saying they wanted to get out of Canada, would that be contrary to the Constitution? Uh, secondly, would it be contrary to international law for Quebec simply to say, well, we've got a referendum, we're leaving, that's it, goodbye Canada, sayonara. And the third question was, well, if there's a conflict between the Constitution and international law, uh, which prevails? And there again, uh, you had a number of conflicting viewpoints. Uh, there was no legal answer. The court could simply have walked away and said, uh, there is nothing in the Constitution that contemplates separation or that forbids separation. Uh, the Constitution of France, for example, says that France is a country one and indivisible. So there is a clear constitutional rule. Uh, there is no such rule uh, in the Canadian Constitution. The Canadian government said, well, we have a Constitution and if Quebec leaves, obviously, uh, it requires an amendment to all those parts of the Constitution that refers to Quebec. And because these changes are so fundamental, it will require the unanimous consent of all the provinces before Quebec could secede. Well, obviously, that was simply a recipe for doing nothing because there was never going to be consensus. You know, the provinces were never going to agree on saying goodbye. Uh, to Quebec, and the, uh, the, the legal outcome would have been a, a desperately unhappy uh, uh, community of uh, Quebecers uh, who had voted on this hypothesis to leave Canada, uh, but who weren't allowed to leave Canada uh, because Prince Edward Island uh, refused to agree. Uh, on the other hand, Quebec said, well, we don't really care what your so-called constitution says, because of course Quebec did not agree to the 1982 constitution. Uh, they said it's entirely international law. If, as we expect, we declare independence from Canada the day after the referendum, and they thought they had an agreement from France, that France would immediately recognize Quebec as an independent country, and as you know, the referendum came within a hair's breadth of success. We were something like 50,000 votes away from uh, uh, breaking up the country. Uh, and in the view of the uh, lawyer who was representing Quebec, uh, if France and some of the Francophone countries and uh, those sympathetic to uh, Quebec's uh, 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 position voted to, to recognize or agreed to recognize Quebec Internationally, you might well have had a fait accompli with uh, Quebec as an independent uh, state. And of course, there are a lot of countries around the world uh, where there are very strong secessionist uh, movements. Uh, we've all been through the business with uh, Catalonia in, in uh, Spain, uh, the uh, northern uh, Italians, the Lombard League, uh, uh, the, the, the Basques in uh, uh, northern Spain and southern uh, uh, France. Uh, 
So this was widely regarded as a very important question of international law, uh, the so-called right of self-determination. But the right of self-determination requires oppression. You're talking generally about an indigenous population that, who have been denied rights equal to the rest of the uh, population or are in some way structurally disadvantaged and who could only achieve uh, their potential as a people outside the uh, federation in which they are uh, held. That's clearly what, you know, not the case in Canada at the time of the secession reference, the prime minister, the chief justice of Canada, and the governor general were all Quebecers. So it was hard to say that they were an oppressed people without political rights uh, in Canada. Nevertheless, that was the argument. But when you talk about judges, you know, should judges be activists? Uh, how many here think the judges should just have thrown up their hands and said, well, it's not a legal problem. There's, no, there's nothing in the Constitution that gives us an answer. Uh, we're supposed to make, uh, apply the law, not make it. Uh, uh, so case dismissed. End of story. Fight it out. Uh, the court didn't do that. Uh, what the court concluded was that, uh, yes, uh, we had the, the Constitution, and the Constitution has to uh, uh, be respected, but the Constitution rests on certain more fundamental principles. Where did these principles come from? Well, they're unwritten. They're, well, they're unwritten because nobody had ever formulated them as fundamental principles of the Constitution until the activist judges of 1998 decided that they were fundamental principles of the uh, Constitution. And those principles included federalism, democracy, uh, constitutional constitutionalism, as it was described, rule of law, respect for minorities. And the respect for minorities had to do with the indigenous population in northern Quebec, who by and large were very opposed uh, to uh, secession. Uh, and what the court said, uh, and again, this is simply building on judicial method, but not building on judicial precedent, by saying, we agree that democracy is important but it is not the only important constitutional value. That equally, over a period of over 120 years or so at that point, uh, Canada has become an integrated state. It's no longer a, a series of disconnected or uh, loosely connected uh, provinces. Uh, there are commercial agreements, there are social agreements, there are transfer payments, there are great webs of interlocking social economic uh, uh, systems. And you can't just rip all of that apart because France says it recognizes Quebec as an independent uh, state. So the court said uh, the rest of Canada can no more ignore a democratic vote in Quebec, a clear majority on a clear question, than Quebec can ignore the rest of Canada and its rights as participants and members of this federation. An activist uh, solution? Yes, a totally activist solution. But nevertheless, it was a solution that was welcomed not only by the federal government, whose argument about the Constitution had been rejected, but equally uh, welcomed by Quebec. Lucien Bouchard came out much to the court's surprise, and said he thought it was terrific judgment because what it said was that in the face of a Quebec vote, uh, the rest of Canada was bound to negotiate in good faith either for renewal of confederation or for uh, terms of separation, which would have been long and messy as we now see in Europe uh, with the vote on uh, Brexit. I mean, disentangling 
uh, unit, which in that case has only existed for 40 years, uh, is a horrendously complicated uh, job. So those are two sort of general uh, examples as to how our country has really been effectively molded uh, by the judges uh, based on our tradition as a people of a liberal democracy wherein the judges play an active role uh, in the formulation of very broad public uh, policy. Uh, Aboriginal rights. Um, there was a good deal of controversy over the inclusion of Aboriginal rights in the Constitution. Uh, they were in, they were out, they were in, they were out, back and forth. Uh, the word existing was added to section 35 so that only existing Aboriginal and treaty rights would be recognized. Uh, but when it came to what was meant by Aboriginal rights, uh, nobody knew. Uh, Trudeau was asked uh, at the Constitutional Conference, well, what do you mean? I mean, what are we saying when we say we recognize Aboriginal rights? And he says, I don't know. He said, uh, but what I do know is that we have a huge problem uh, in Canada with the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities, and the judges can't mess it up any worse than the politicians. So kick it into the courts, see what they do. Uh, so they did. Uh, and the court struggled because they weren't operating on precedent. There was no, uh, you know, going back to the Federalist Papers as in the United States and saying, well, Alexander Hamilton, uh, before he was in the musical, uh, wrote this terrific <laughs> article uh, and uh, that gives us the answer. Uh, what the court had to do was to say, well, the original idea of Aboriginal rights is that uh, they pre-exist the uh, coming of the Europeans to, in this case, North America. Uh, and under British colonial law, uh, which was developed really in the West Indies, not uh, in Canada, is that the local law continued until it was changed by the authority of the empire, the British imperial uh, authority, the governor. Uh, and those rights of the indigenous population were held at pleasure. And that means they were very vulnerable to be displaced when Her Majesty showed her pleasure that they should no longer exist. And so over the initial centuries of the British uh, occupation of uh, North America, when you would get a, la a letters patent for a piece of land, it simply destroyed the Aboriginal rights because it was an expression of the pleasure of the crown that this land no longer belonged to the Mississaugas, but it now belonged to the Bishop of Oshawa. Uh, and the notion of reconciliation, which has become so fundamental to Aboriginal rights, was initially just, you know, people get used to it, reconcile yourselves, you know. The British are here, the British have taken over, the British are sovereign, you know, resign yourself. And it was the judges who said, well, that's not really what Canada is all about in the 1980s and 1990s. There were cases uh, that uh, held, the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal held in a couple of cases, that, uh, well, uh, the rights of Aboriginal peoples were held at pleasure before the Constitution. The Constitution recognized those rights. Therefore, the Constitution recognized rights held at pleasure, which could be as extinguished as easily after 1982 as before. And uh, the courts uh, uh, said no. Uh, although legally speaking, the Saskatchewan answer was probably correct if you are looking at a literal transposition of rights existing 
before 1982 into the post-charter world. Uh, but the judges said, uh, no, uh, we are not going to be uh, responsible for emptying uh, the hopes and aspirations carried in section 35 uh, of all meaning uh, by taking a very narrow uh, approach. Uh, the court referred to section 35 in terms of the promise of section 35, that this was an attempt by Canada to mend itself by bringing the Aboriginal communities and the non-Aboriginal communities together. And reconciliation came to be understood not as resign yourself, give up, the British are here. It came to be understood as, you know, let us now try to work out a way of living together that allows uh, Aboriginal people's space to be Aboriginal but at the same time living in a harmonious relationship with others. And of course, there isn't a sharp divide between uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. The, uh, you know, the, the Aboriginal people, for example, up at Curve Lake who uh, work in uh, you know, the General Motors factories or uh, Quaker Oats and uh, General Electric in Peterborough go to high school, I mean, they're they have uh, as, as much uh, attachment to the Canada that the rest of us live in as they do to their uh, Aboriginal ancestry. And for that reason, the, the idea of Citizens Plus uh, has attracted a good deal of uh, support. And in one of the uh, judgments which I wrote, I, I picked up an idea from the Royal Commission on the Aboriginal peoples of merged sovereignty that Canada really wasn't you know, French, uh, English, you know, Her Majesty, the Queen, and the rest of it, but it really was the people of Canada, which included the Aboriginal people as much as the French, the English, the Ukrainians, the Russians, and Italians, Portuguese, and everybody else. We were all in there, and uh, the, the country, the sovereignty of the country, resided in that uh, way. So, uh, the, the road uh, to the recognition of Aboriginal rights has traveled from this colonial concept to a decision recently in a case called Chilcotin in British Columbia, where in effect the Supreme Court of Canada said, look, the Chilcotin people have been living in this valley in the interior of the British, in British Columbia for centuries. They have used the land. They are nomadic people, so they don't you know, have permanent uh, communities in the sense that would be recognized in, in Europe. Uh, but they uh, uh, were here to essentially the exclusion of non-Aboriginal people. And so far as the Supreme Court is concerned, they have uh, the rights uh, that should attach to people who have that level of attachment to their traditional uh, lands. Of course, the problem with that is that it's fine in Chilcotin, but what about communities in southern Ontario where it's no longer possible to restore people to their traditional lands, traditional uh, lifestyle? It's fine to recognize the rights of an Aboriginal uh, First Nation that happens to sit on oil wells in Alberta and are multimillionaires as opposed to the Aboriginal community on the Sweetgrass Reserve in Saskatchewan, which is sitting on a pile of rocks in the middle of the uh, least desirable land in, uh, in the province. So uh, the courts have recognized that their ability uh, to bring about a reconciliation, a just resolution, is very limited. And that is why they keep urging the communities to negotiate, to come up with answers which are far more broadly based, much less narrowly focused uh, than uh, court decisions. And therefore, the court developed this right to consult, which is fundamental now to Aboriginal law, uh, that Aboriginal peoples have a right to be brought into the discussion as to what should happen if a pipeline is to run across traditional lands to the West Coast or uh, 
to the Maritimes. So uh, I don't want to belabor uh, you know, these points, but I think you can see and make up your own mind as to whether the court, uh, by undertaking the level of creativity and uh, interventionist uh, uh, work that it has, is for the good of Canada or is not for the good of Canada. I mean, you know, there are people like uh, some of the American judges who say, well, we, everything should be done as at the time of the revolution. And if uh, we have the death penalty and we have flogging and we have, uh, you know, public shaming and all the rest, so be it. Uh, that's the way the country was founded and the judges have no political legitimacy in changing it. Uh, by all means, change the Constitution, but do so democratically, not undemocratically through the judges. So, you know, there, there's a lot to be said on both sides of this uh, debate, uh, but I think, uh, well, I mean, in, in Canada, for example, if you uh, accepted originalism, you would still not have women in the Senate because, according to the law, women were not persons uh, before. Uh, you know, in 1867. And it was the judges who said, well, that's rubbish. I mean, you know, look at them. <laughs> they look like people, you know, <laughs> should be treated as people. Uh, so uh, there's only one other uh, thing I'd touch on, uh, if I have time, uh, and that is equality rights, um, uh, which are uh, of fundamental importance and probably the most difficult part of the Constitution, or the Charter. Uh, when the equality rights were um, uh, first being interpreted by the courts, it was on the uh, basis that people similarly situated should be similarly treated. So the, the, the courts were concerned with uh, distinctions. And uh, the opening language of the Equality Rights Clause is not about discrimination at all. It says that everybody has the uh, right to equal benefit and equal protection of the law. And initially, the courts around the country would say, well, that's much broader than discrimination. Uh, if, for example, I'm a truck driver in, uh, in Oshawa and I'm in a collision on the job, I have to go to the workers' compensation and I get a much lower level of compensation than I would if I could sue in the courts in tort. Uh, whereas the person he hits in his truck, uh, the woman who's driving uh, uh, to work uh, uh, in her pickup truck, this being Oshawa, uh, uh, you know, she's not on the job, therefore she doesn't have to go to workers' compensation. She goes to the courts and claims uh, uh, damages for loss of income, uh, moral damages, uh, pain and suffering, all sorts of things which workers' compensation doesn't really uh, address. And initially the court said, well, those people don't get the equal benefit of the law. So therefore, this whole workers' compensation scheme has a big problem because it, it discriminates in a way that is uh, unacceptable. Uh, and then the, the, the Supreme Court said, look, uh, the law is a mass of classifications. Most of the law consists of classifications, drawing lines between this group who get a benefit, that group who don't get the benefit, this group who are allowed to do this, and that group uh, who is not allowed to do it. And institutionally, the court is not capable of, get, of taking on every distinction made by parliament in every law and by the legislatures in every provincial law and deciding rationally, well, we think the, equal, the benefit is equal or we don't. So judicially, in this case, activism ratcheted back the language of the Constitution and said, we're going to ignore the opening language of uh, section 15, the equality rights section, and we're going to say it is an anti-discrimination provision. And the way the section reads is you get equal benefit and so on, protection of the law, and then, the, and then it says, and in particular, in particular, without discrimination based on race, creed, religion, 
and so on. And the court said, well, really what this is all about is the in particular. Well, it's not. That's not right. That's not a grammatical reading of the section. Uh, and yet, uh, the Supreme Court said that's how it's going to be read because we don't think, uh, given our role in the Constitution of Canada, we have the expertise to make these what are properly legislative judgments unless legislative judgments infringe on certain basic uh, human rights not to be discriminated against on the enumerated grounds and analogous uh, uh, grounds. So my, my point is that activism runs in both directions. It is expansive in some of the ways I've described and it is contractive in, uh, in the equality rights and if we had time we could go into other uh, sections and we had time and you had patience uh, other sections of, of the Constitution. But I, I, I and I'd be glad to, to take questions, but I, I think, uh, you know, what is important uh, uh, that we all understand is that, uh, as the court said in the Quebec succession reference, the only source of legitimacy in this country is not democracy. Democracy is fundamental, and democracy gives us our essentially lawmaking authority through the uh, House of Commons. Uh, but there are other uh, constitutional actors, including the judges, and I guess including the senators, uh, who, uh, who have a role to play. And until the Constitution is changed, there they are. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, generally speaking, in, in, in my view, it is desirable that you have judges who are prepared to adjust the system as society evolves. I mean, the whole question of gay rights, for example, uh, 1867, even 1982, wouldn't have occurred to the members of parliament uh, that uh, they were uh, enacting gay rights. Alberta passed a human rights code well after 1982, where there was a dis specific decision to exclude gay rights. And yet, society evolves, opinion evolves, people begin to understand better the community they live in, uh, and the court says it, the time has come to include uh, gay rights as an element uh, of, of the uh, analogous grounds as we describe them uh, in the equality provision. So it's uh, a mixed bag, but uh, I'd be glad to address any questions you might have.